Ja, einen schönen guten Abend. Ich begrüße Sie alle recht herzlich zu unserer ersten Kunstverbotsveranstaltung hier im schönen Kinosaal des Museum Ludwig. Ähm, Kunstverbot ist eine Veranstaltung der Freunde des Freier Friedrichs Museums des Museum Ludwig. Und ähm, wir freuen uns sehr, dass Sie alle hier sind. Wir haben ja seit diesem Jahr eine neue Startuhrzeit. 18 Uhr finden wir für unsere Vorträge, Performances und Talks statt. Und ich hoffe, dass das Ihnen einen Spaß kommt und Sie vielleicht auch den einen oder anderen noch davon genießen. Und ähm, ich möchte den Moment nutzen und zum einen ausdrücken, wie sehr ich freue, dass wir zu dieser Ausstellung antikoloniale Eingriffe hier im Museum Ludwig in der Reihe Hier und Jetzt im Museum Ludwig äh, auch diesen Vortrag noch machen können mit Elena Glaube und Jan Philipp Bühnen, der durch diesen Abend moderieren wird. Und ich möchte es aber nicht versäumen, Sie und euch alle herzlich einzuladen zu diesem Donnerstag. Donnerstag, der 19. Januar, findet hier im Museum Ludwig ein Kunstspielchen statt, eine Veranstaltung für ein gemischtes und auch sehr junges studentisches Publikum, aber nicht ausschließlich, mit vielen Führungen, Kuratorenführungen von der Ausstellungskuratorin Joan Rodriguez, aber eben auch die Künstlerin Paloma Ayala ist zugegen, nicht nur heute Abend, sondern auch am Donnerstag. Lesung finden statt und vieles mehr. Da würde ich uns sicherlich freuen, jungen Kunstfreunde und Veranstalter, wenn Sie hier kommen möchten. Vielen Dank und jetzt würde ich direkt an Jan Bühnen übergeben. Ja, ich von mir, ähm, wir würden jetzt ins Englische ähm, überspringen, aber nachher bei den Fragen ähm, können Sie auch gerne Fragen auf Deutsch stellen, wenn man das geht, finde ich mal das jetzt zu übersetzen. Ähm, und Question in Spanish or something else Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, uh, I won't be able to translate those. <laughs> I can. Uh, no, it'll be fine. Um, yes, so thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's going to be a very interesting evening with Elena Rosalvo. Um, she is currently the coordinator and the postdoctoral researcher at the Latin American Center at the University of Zurich. Um, she has been a lecturer in several universities, a guest lecturer in several universities in Europe and the Americas, and has published widely on contemporary Latin American art. Her interdisciplinary research um, draws, among other fields, on visual cultures, visual studies, and memory studies, political ecologies and even anthropology of art. As well as an academic, she's also a curator and has curated and co-directed um, La Capsula in Zurich, an independent art space, um, yeah, mainly building bridges between the two emerging art scenes of Latin America and Switzerland. Um, tonight, she will introduce us to you, and I'm very excited to learn and discuss uh, a very complex question, the question of uh, Latin American art and what it is and is there such a thing as Latin American art. And I think I'll keep it at that for now. We'll do three slots. So we'll start with the 10 to 15 minute part of the talk yep. and switch to questions um, and a bit of a discussion. Then we'll do another 10 minutes. Um, yeah. so. Perfect. Um, this is on. Yes. So hello, everyone. I'm behind all this, but I hope you can you can listen to me and bear with me for the next I don't know hour or so. Um, so first of all, um, thank you all for being here, and especially thank you to Joanna Rodriguez. Uh, for the wonderful exhibition that she um, curated, for the invitation, to Diane um, Cicilski also for the invitation, um, to the friends of the, of the Waldorf um, Richards Museum and to the Ludwig Museum uh, for organizing um, this talk. Um, and tonight I will reflect on questions that um, I believe are important in approaching contemporary um, Latin American art, as well as in exploring um, the exhibition, Anti-Colonial Interventions, here at the Ludwig Museum. 
Um, the place I speak from is traversed by my academic journey and my professional career, as well as by my personal path uh, and affinities. I am a Spaniard, educated in European universities, but I have, from day one of my university studies, focused on contemporary Latin American art. I've been lucky enough to have been able to study and work with several Latin American uh, professors and then with several Latin American artists. Um, and now, living and working in Switzerland, I continue to investigate this field in both my position as a postdoctoral researcher and in my professional activity as a curator. So, as you can see, the place I speak from um, is traversed by all this and also by an entire network of aesthetical, political relations and affections uh, of which I am a part. Um, and so, before I start, as uh, Philip already said, for the purpose of having some spaces for interacting and also clarification, I don't know, discussion, um, I have divided the talk in three parts, and then after each part, which is, I hope, 10 to 15 minutes, um, we can have some time, so you can ask questions, German, Spanish, English, we can translate, I mean, maybe together. Um, and I hope you feel like asking questions or making comments. Um, yeah, so having said this, let's begin with the very first question that we should ask ourselves um, today, which is, what is Latin American art? Um, how could we define it, right? Does Latin American art exist as a distinct artistic expression, different from other arts, from other regions? What does this category or label bring to the art practices and discourses that Latin American artists display in their works? Um, would any of you want to try to answer these questions? Maybe later? Okay, so, but think about what idea of Latin American art you have in your mind. Uh, what names come to your mind? So maybe Frida Kahlo, I guess, this would be one of the first um, names, and maybe this, this uh, painting would be one of the first images um, that you could imagine, or maybe Fernando Botero, I don't know, another very, very famous um, and big Latin American artist. Um, what other Latin American artists do you know? Maybe Paloma? You know Paloma already? <laughs> so, well, now let us do a little history of the idea of Latin American art to think about these questions that I just posed. Uh, but let me warn you, though, that we will not reach a stable definition of what Latin American art is, because I think this is an impossible task. However, when it comes to grasping Latin American art, I believe that the most important thing is to understand the processes, the debates, and the context in which it has developed. And I'm going to try to give you a brief overview of all this. So the label Latin American art emerged in the United States uh, in the late 1930s. And before that, the term more commonly used for the art produced in the region was Hispano-American art. But then again, what does Latin American art refer to? Is it meant to capture a separate, distinct artistic category? Or is it more of a curatorial or a market label? So authors like Joaquin Barriendos have undertaken the difficult task to reflect on this. Uh, and in his eyes, Latin, Latin American art is a geo-aesthetic category whereby, and I quote him, the temporal hierarchies and spatial disjunctions of our global imaginaries have been made evident since modernity coloniality. So this is quite dense. Uh, but I will translate it, saying that the term Latin American art does point to a history of colonialism in the region that it is still unfolding, uh, even after several independence processes, even after modernity, postmodernity in the region. So these issues have, of course, to do with the discussion around the very concept of Latin America itself which, um, as our historian uh, Damian Bayon summarizes, is a somewhat conventional expression coined primarily in Europe to include all the countries colonized by the Spanish and the Portuguese, 
plants, um, some islands and smaller areas later colonized by the French, even the English and the Dutch. So um, the inadequacy of the name Latin America has prompted some indigenous and activist groups to argue for the use of the name Aviayala, which you might have heard already, which in the Kuna language means land in its full maturity or land of vital blood. And is used by the Panamanian Kuna people to refer to the American continent before the arrival of Columbus. The use of this term and other alternatives could, could be part of a vital decolonization process. Nonetheless, while the name Latin America is rife with contradiction, it does allow us to consider artists, practices, and contexts that are mainly underrepresented, excluded, or ignored in hegemonic European and North American art historical narratives. Here, and usually in all my work, I choose to keep using uh, the term Latin America or Latin American art, um, always being aware of its heavy weight and its intertwining with coloniality. The discussion around Latin American art's identity has stood at the center of academic and curatorial debates, especially since the, since the 1970s. And for curator Mari Carmen Ramirez, uh, for instance, this was bound up with the neo-colonial legacy of the United States in the region, which took on renewed importance as a result of the political, diplomatic, and economic power interests of the US from the 70s on. So, in the Western art world of the early decades of the 20th century, and in parallel with the historical avant-garde, identity was generally viewed as a token of nations and peoples with static profiles. This same view was generally shared in the Latin American countries. There were believed to be repertoires of forms and content, contents that art could present. Art was seen as the specific expression of a geography and a shared history in pursuit of the same emancipatory dreams. And Latin American art was therefore also considered in this uh, first half of the 20th century a specific expression of one geography, in this case exuberant, dramatic, extensive, and even romantic, and of a shared history, a history of indigenous pasts, colonization, miscegenation, and so on. But such a reductionist conception condemned Latin American artists to isolation, backwardness, exoticism, and folklorism. And as a result, in the middle decades of the 20th century, many artists sought to overcome this perceived backwardness and exoticism by importing avant-garde uh, cosmopolitan forms, but always under a shadow of suspicion as to their originality and artistic meanings. So after World War II, abstract art in Latin America was predominantly organized around a rational geometrical visual language, as in every other part of the world, as well, and was seen as part of a program for a new uh, and universal modern society. This was uh, inspired by European sources, the avant-garde European works, artists who went there to live in, uh, in Europe and studied there, the influence of the Bauhaus, and also by the recovery of pre-Hispanic abstraction in textiles and architecture. Then, by the 1960s and 1970s, art was no longer believed to be separate from its social and political context, and national or regional identities began to be viewed as expressing struggles that, they, that were part of historical conflicts against imperialism and acculturation. The concept of identity and modernity in general was called into question, becoming more complex and relative. So identities were no longer ahistorical essences, but the transitory result of hybridity, negotiations, strategies, and even accidental choices. Diverse subjectivities, high, um, syncretism, appropriation, and renovation were, from then on, the keys to understanding the art produced in Latin America. Nonetheless, uh, for authors like Monica Amor, both approaches, so the static identities and exoticism, and then the very diverse uh, 
subjectivities and hybridity are equally essentialist and obstructive since to fall into the postmodern cliche of hybridity or total heterogeneity would be just as reductionist as the static modern totalizations. So we come to the 1990s and then the question of identity was debated mainly through an interrogation of the place of enunciation. So one speaks from Latin America. Yet the acknowledgement of the place of enunciation did not alter the logics of circulation in the contemporary art world, nor seriously intervened in the global geopolitics of knowledge. There are still artists being born in the wrong side of art history, as Pablo Elguera would put it. So, um, also the question of whether Latin American art had to be included in the Western tradition or whether its relationship with it was peripheral or quite separate was another important point of debate during the second half of the 20th century. Again, curator Mari Carmen Ramirez's view, for example, is that Latin American culture falls within the Western tradition because of its colonial legacy and that its specificities have to do with strategies of appropriation, recycling, or repossession in relation to models or aspects of the Euro-American culture that respond to the needs of Latin American realities. So on the other hand, some critics and theorists have pointed to the idea of the fantastic or the marvelous real or the magical real as one of the fundamentals of Latin American, Latin American cultural identity. Art historian Gabriel Pelu Folinari, on the contrary, has argued that this emphasis on the idea of the fantastic is just an updated version of the 16th century colonialist imaginary with new market connotations and a new discriminatory strategy on the cultural map. Um, Mari Carmen Ramirez, uh, again, enumerates the stereotyped formal signifiers of this conception uh, of the fantastic as the essence of Latin American art, namely tropical colors, um, chromatic and compositional lushness, and the savage expression of formal conventions. So the fantastic is usually tropical, right? And this idea of the tropical acknowledges the impact of climate, flora, and location on culture. But of course, there is much more than tropical nature in Latin America. Um, as Brazilian artist Elio Oiticica said, the myth of tropicality is much more than parrots and banana trees. Uh, and actually for him, tropicality was the consciousness of not being conditioned by established structures, and hence it was highly revolutionary. Um, and this would be an example of how also stereotypes and reductionist categories have also been appropriated by artists and put into play as a sort of uh, revolutionary and radical strategies. So now with Oitisica, we have entered the realm of conceptual art. Uh, conceptualism in Latin America during the 60s and the 70s was characterized by its intervention into the region's socio-political context. So in contrast to other parallel avant-garde tendencies or neo-avant-garde tendencies centered on formal innovation, the outstanding feature of the conceptual avant-garde in Latin America was the merging of arts, art and politics into a socio-artistic project of emancipation. And this is also the time of, let's say, the revolutionary politics, right, um, in Latin America. So as an example, I brought you um, this work that you, I, that you are seeing by Brazilian artist Sildo Meireles. So um, he, in an attempt to avoid censorship during the military dictatorship in Brazil, while still reaching audiences and participants all over the country, created the insertions into ideological circuits projects. So this is just the first project, and for this uh, one, he removed um, glass Coca-Cola bottles from circulation, uh, then applied messages onto them in white, as you can see. Um, these messages were either subversive political messages or instructions on how to use the bottle as a Molotov cocktail. 
And then he put the bottles back into circulation, empty, uh, since um, these were every time uh, refilled over and over. Um, and so this, also this Coca-Cola bottle um, was an everyday mass-produced object and also at the time a symbol, of course, of the, of the US imperialism and uh, of ca capitalist consumerism. So in the 80s and especially the 90s, an art criticism emerged that undertook deeper analysis and linked itself with critical theories, most notably post-colonial, post-modern and feminist. Then arose the need to revise, um, to revise art historiography associated with the concept of Latin America, which, as we have seen, was still both all-encompassing and reductionist at the same time. The concept of identity definitely lost currency in these decades, as did the modern macro-narratives that sustained it. As curator and art historian Gerardo Mosquera points out in a text um, significantly titled and this is the whole title, Goodbye Identity, Welcome Difference from Latin American Art to Art from Latin America. Uh, this is the title. So he says that the neurosis of identity, that is the construction of differentiated identities of resistance to Europe and the US, um, this neurosis of identity went into crisis in the 1990s. Mosquera argues that the artist's self-consciousness of belonging to a historical cultural entity misnamed Latin America was maintained, but problematized. New concepts and questions around Latin American art began to appear. The importance of processes of hybridization or creole creolization was claimed to be crucial with such notions of, as fragmentation, diversity, juxtaposition, and collage forming part of the recently assumed postmodern Latin American ethos. Accordingly, active processes of mixing, um, reinvention, syncretism, postcolonial anthropophagy, uh, or resignification came to be valued. Furthermore, alongside these issues, in the wake of multicultural discourses, other claims such as those of indigenous groups excluded from, from or only partially included in the narratives of uh, post-colonial nation states, were also beginning to be voiced uh, with greater force. Um, there were also other claims, such as those of migrant groups, uh, both within or beyond the region, and discourses that recovered early colonial history uh, and its tensions and violence following the celebrations and occultations of the Queen Centenary in 1992. So against this very complex background, uh, Mosquera in his test uh, goes on to argue, somewhat naively, I think, that by the late 20th century, Latin American art no longer needed to declare its identity explicitly in order to be legitimized. However, he also remarks on the, danger of, on the dangers of uh, cosmopolitanism domesticating differences and thus forcing Latin American artists to adopt an international postmodern language that controls diversity. Anyway, um, while we can assert uh, that there is more plurality in contemporary art circuits in the 21st century, um, the center periphery or the north-south schema continues to dominate interactions as economic and power structures are upheld. Within Latin America, there is not a single artistic center but rather a multi-centered network. Yet again, despite the supposed globalization of the art world, exchange remains unequal, and in most, most of the region, the structures of art uh, remain underdeveloped. On this subject, Joaquin Barriendos cautions that with the use of such concepts as transculturation or hybridization, nowadays overvalued, Latin America is being reinvented and consumed as an exhibition project. And I find this idea very compelling. Um, the Mexican researcher sees contemporary Latin American art caught between what are in principle two opposite poles. On the one hand, the problem of um, the strategic de Latin, Latin Americanization, which seeks um, its place in the global art system as Mosquera previously asserted, 
And on the other hand, the consolidation of a Latin American art world in archives, universities, biennials, art fairs, museums, galleries, etc. According to Barriendos, by ceasing to be Latin American, the work of artists from the region also ceases to be considered subaltern and derivative and produces its own heterogeneity through the appropriation and resignification of the global, while, and this is the big while, leaving aside everything controversial about globalization. On the other hand, having a Latin American art world of its own creates a market niche no longer trapped in the affirmation of identity. So, <laughs> the idea of Latin American art, as we have seen, uh, points to many historical, political, and aesthetic tensions. And I recommend always being mindful of these tensions when looking at and interpreting not just art practices uh, created in or from Latin America, but also all works of Western art. Uh, and the discourses and categorizations around them, as these concerns are similarly inserted in postmodern and post-colonial power structures in the North, um, albeit from a privileged place. Um, so this is the first part, and I hope, I don't know, um, we have maybe some questions or comments before going on, or you need translation for, for something. Um, Let's take a pause and try to... <laughs> um, yeah, are there are already questions, so should I begin with mine? Um, so yeah, and basically, uh, that is to correctly, I know this is an abbreviation of a breakdown, more complex and longer after the disease, but um, so you would say that there are kind of four episodes um, since the beginning of the 20th century, you have like how Latin American art was understood. Mm -hmm. And uh, while most of the people who quoted are uh, either Latin American mm -hmm. or um, researchers in the field, I was interested um, if you would say that um, all or some of these kind of definitions of uh, Latin American art, if they were. Um, how they were perceived in Latin America, or like uh, you mentioned the first one, kind of in the 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, the term Latin American art was really invented in the US, and kind of how this dynamic maybe shifted over the years, or was it more like an assertion from the outside all the way through? Um, I would say that it was kind of appropriated from the beginning. Uh, by artists and also by curators and, and critics in the region. So it kind of took over yeah, the, the previous uh, names or, or labels. Um, and since then, uh, Latin American, they have used the term. So the discussion and, and the, the authors I have quoted, all of them are Latin American. Uh, but of course, the exhibitions of Latin American art that, yeah, mainly from the 80s uh, onward, uh, that have been done throughout the world. I mean, they have been in the US mostly, also in Europe. So from a curatorial point of view, I would say the, the concept has always worked more uh, from, from the outside of the region. But as for the theories and histories and the debates, um, they have been more important within the region. But let's not forget that the US is also a part of Latin America, let's say, uh, because many researchers, art critics, curators, historians, all of them Latin America, Latin American, they work in the US. So they kind of, you know, do their work there. It comes back. Um, so there is this one um, very important uh, seminar that took place, if I'm correct, in 1976, I think. Uh, and most of the people participating, Mari Carmen Ramirez, uh, Damian Bayon, so all of them, um, they were Latin Americans. Most of them were working in the US, but they celebrated the workshop in Mexico. So kind of, I, I guess, um, to bring it back to Latin America. So I think it's also a question of uh, legitimation, 
from the outside within the art world. But um, yeah, I would say that in the 90s, um, so the, this Latin American that Barriendos was referring to um, has been more robust and has grown much more than before the 90s. So now we could say that there is much more discussion uh, and debate going on in Latin America, in the Latin American countries regarding what is Latin American art and, and um, yeah, what belongs to this category um, in Latin America than in the outside. Maybe also because it's, it's a question of um, the interest of the market. I don't know, that also can play its role, right? Um, so the global market is not interested anymore in Latin American art. I don't know. Uh, I, can, I can come to it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I want to say things that come to the little bit common question because I think it's something that can, uh, one of the, one of another of these dialectics or contradictions we can see in the history of the generation now can be this relationship with this that is outside art in a distant moment. For instance, I think I did in Peru, but there are probably countries which is the same. This, uh, this artisan work from the I mean, the uh, Andean region, they do this kind of stuff that usually circulates in the industry of tourism, but they have their function. And at least since the 70s, at least this is proven the case, we have a relationship where artists relate to that and use it, mm -hmm. or there's a debate, this is art, this is not art. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know if this thing, uh, also you can see in the different countries you analyze how it works in this kind of yeah, I mean, if I if I understood your comment or the direction of your comment, I think it's also I mean, uh, we can see like the the big picture of Latin American art and how it's uh, defined from the outside and then from the from within and within each country we have the same right with uh, indigenous communities, with, uh, with black groups, black, black peoples. So uh, this kind of um, different, uh, let's say, expressions, artistic expressions that are appropriated and then uh, try to uh, be made part of uh, somehow an identity. And, and this is always a struggle. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I mean, we should do the history of each Latin American country, you know, how, how the label Latin America works within this um, national identity and what other identities are in play um, within the country. So I don't know if you go in that direction or another, because... <laughs> no, it, yeah. mm -hmm. So in the 80s, I didn't know this function you're referring to, but there is another function, I think also in Mexico, that they create this thing called the Teoría Social del Arte. Uh, I think it's, that's another it's one. It's another yeah. one, yeah. So they have this fan art chart, you have like yeah. uh, Marta Trava, you have the club, I think, students. It's, it's, I forgot the name, but it's Argentinian. And what, it's interesting because there, basically, what they say there, one of the points is like the Latin American experience with art makes you be more kind of conscious conscious of the of the object of art itself because you have this experience that you relate to other objects that are like this I mean like the piece made in the community there which which I mean you, you, you see that your art is different from that art or whatever it is because you have the institutionality of the museum in, 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 I don't know, in the capital or the metropolis I think so then there's this feeling of some some, some sociality of, of, of the pieces that are yeah, so I was going to that, that can be also mm -hmm. included in this. Story. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And I think it also kind of refers back to the different uh, chapter that I have been uh, kind of, uh, yeah, giving an, an overview. So in the seminar that I referred to, um, they were still, you know, talking about identity and what is Latin American art. But then in the 80s, as, as you said, the, the most important question is, uh, what is art in relation to the social, right? And how are we integrating um, other people's, other communities' ideas within our artwork, right? So these are the different layers that 
with time and uh, with many debates in many different places from the outside, from within, uh, have kind of made up um, this very porous and uh, extensive idea of what Latin American art is, right? And then we can, we can translate this uh, kind of the same to every, each and every um, Latin American country. Um, yeah, and some of them, I don't know if Peru, but I know that uh, in Argentina, the debates were the same, right? In the 50s, what is Argentinian art and what makes Argentinian this painting and not the other one, right? And then these debates go kind of, yeah, losing force and uh, many other issues uh, related to the social context come into play. And yeah, and so this is kind of the history that I really wanted to show you. Um, yeah, thank you. Maybe one more question, kind of heading up on the text, like following up on you, really, um, because uh, yeah, was what you were talking about were these people more? Yeah, she's got this. Um, were these people more referring to fine art, kind of like in, in a sort of maybe a Western perspective, or um, because you just mentioned kind of how art and, and artisans what they produce in other contexts is maybe different to what a European uh, might understand. And so I was kind of thinking, um, yeah, not just to question what is Latin American art, but kind of what art is mm -hmm. referring to, not just the Latin American part. Yeah, well, I mean, if I have to start with the question, what is art, then I don't think we... <laughs> yes. No, no, I know. I know, I know. But uh, I was saying this because, of course, I mean, uh, uh, they were speaking, so all these people that, that I have um, quoted and, and mentioned, um, they are talking about fine arts. Fine, uh, maybe fine arts is also a very um, antique uh, term, I don't know. But um, yeah, let's say arts that uh, artworks that are shown in museums and galleries and have kind of a, a commercial circuit, not uh, you know artisan pieces. Um, so, but I think interestingly, uh, in the from the I guess I, I don't know exactly, but I would say that from the seventies and the eighties on, this kind of other objects are, are appropriated and, and they are integrated in, in what art is and what Latin American art is. And um, yeah, and maybe we can discuss with another work that I'm gonna show you uh, in a moment. Uh, yeah, I don't know if to spoil it or, or not, but no, yeah, we can, yeah, we can okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, about the, the, yeah. the politics. Yeah, I mean, if there is no other mm -hmm. question, then yeah, I can. Yeah. Ah, okay. So like this. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if like this. I, I'm I'm tiny, so <laughs> so maybe like this. Can you see me better? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's get going. Um, so well, after this very brief uh, and dense at the same time overview of the idea of Latin American art and all the complexity that goes with it, um, let's move on to what I believe are the hegemonic themes or concepts of contemporary Latin American art, um, especially since the 90s. We will start with uh, anti-coloniality and political activism, and then we will go on uh, to the third part with violence. Uh, but first, a uh, very important note, I think, I do not mean to imply that these issues um, are what define Latin American art, nor that Latin American artists can or should only deal with these themes, with these subjects, um, not at all. But they are three issues that are very widespread in contemporary Latin American art, 
as well as urgent problems in the national and regional contexts. Um, so, and I decided I was um, not going to expand on the theoretical issue of anti or post coloniality uh, because there have already been two specific talks, uh, talks uh, on the subject linked to the exhibition, uh, one by Joanna Rodriguez and the other by Dr. Kea Vinant. Uh, but then maybe in the questions we can further and deepen a little bit into the theory. So what I decided is to show you some recent works by two Peruvian artists, uh, Sandra Gamarra and Daniela Ortiz, uh, who work from an anti-colonial feminist position while they are very active in the political activism arena. So writing, doing interviews, and visibly supporting several anti-colonial claims. And uh, to provide some context, so during the 18th century, casta paintings were a popular genre among Spanish elites. Created first in the Spanish vice royalty of New Spain, uh, the capital of which was Mexico City, these paintings were commissioned to provide a glimpse into the interracial relationships and daily life of the colonial population. This included the depiction of Spaniards, mestizos, uh, who are the Spanish Europeans born in the Americas, um, indigenous peoples, Africans, and other forms of race mixings. Each, paintings, uh, each, each painting, as you can see, usually shows a woman, a man, and a child, or two childs, two children. Um, the inscriptions in Spanish um, on the top provide uh, racial identifications for each figure, which read as if the phenomenon of human reproduction function like a math equation. Um, so it says, for instance, the one on the left from Spanish and black, mulatto. And the second one on the right from mestizo and Indian, coyote. Um, the castas bound race, pseudoscience, and social status into a hierarchical system in which white Spaniards placed themselves at the top. These paintings were created for the Spanish gaze, obviously, serving as didact didactics for the racial makeup of the colonies. For mestizos, casta paintings also asserted their European heritage and belief in white supremacy while carving out their colonial identity. And based on these paintings, the two contemporary Peruvian artists have created series with an anti-colonial feminist perspective. So first, um, Sandra Gamarra. Uh, and this was the painting I was referring to before. Uh, we can talk about this and artisanry. Um, she brings together a series of 20 paintings commissioned by the artist, but not created by her not painted by her, by her, and produced in Dafen, an oil painting village in China. They are copies of a series of casta paintings commissioned to the Peruvian painter Cristóbal de Lozano in 1717 by the Viceroy uh, Manuel de Amati Vignette. Gamarra added painted captions below, as you can see, uh, below each image, with quotations from texts by contemporary feminists such as Silvia Federici or Claudia Mancei Nogueira. They serve to update the original paintings by questioning the use of certain terms in the original works and, above all, um, by questioning the verbs to produce, to reproduce. The quotations refer to reproductive labor as the under-recognized precondition of salaried work. In Gamarra's paintings, the women holding their children can be understood as fundamental to the production and reproduction of the labor force that sustains capitalism. So, the second artist I wanted to show you is Daniel Ortiz, um, who you might already seen here at the museum because she's one of the artists in anti-colonial interventions. Um, so here I have her White Castas series. Um, here she uses some of the iconographic elements of the original Casta paintings to create a classification of 16 types of what she calls political whiteness. The oil paintings give us a detailed description of contemporary white supremacy structures. 
thus analyzing the current colonial system in which we live. Um, here, for instance, in the image you have on the left, uh, she depicts white intellectuals, intellectuales blancos, and explains how they both silence and appropriate knowledge generated in the South in order to maintain the colonial power structures. Other paintings of the series describe how the police, social workers, the legal system, doctors, or politicians, among many others, exert their white supremacy. And as you can see on the right, uh, the series was first installed in the preserved dining hall of La Virreina in Barcelona, uh, which is a building erected in 1772 by the Viceroy Amat y Union, the one that I mentioned before, who was the first authority to bring the Casta paintings uh, to Spain, from Peru to Spain. Um, so another work by Daniel Ortiz that I think shows very well um, also this anti-colonial and feminist pers perspective in contemporary Latin American art is titled Patria Potestas. As you can see, it is also a tribute to the two Fridas that we saw at the beginning of this talk and to Frida's difficult, difficult experience uh, with motherhood. So the painting is a self-portrait separated in two as she says, in two legal frames that impose violence uh, towards her motherhood while she was living in Spain. As she explains, on the one hand, the Jus Sanguinis, which would be the self-portrait on the right, the one in red, um, which the Jus Sanguinis, which is the legal system that do not recognize the children of migrant families that were born in the Spanish territory as nationals, imposing them to go through the institutional racism of the immigration office since the moment they are born. On the other hand, which is the left-hand side here, the patria potestas, which gives power and control to the father even if he's absent, as it was in Daniela's personal experience. As Daniela states in the caption below, these two legal frames that exert violence onto migrant mothers and their children emanate from colonial power. And so, as we have seen with the works by Gamarra and Ortiz, many contemporary Latin American artists enter the public arena to put the spotlight, at the spotlight on anti-colonial, feminist, and other urgent political issues. This way, they exert a form of artistic activism while being engaged with social and political activism. They question and expand the traditional discourses around art by pointing out other possible vanishing points and making the cracks in the canon visible. They present the public with a different gaze, gaze one that is critical, for it raises uh, questions, points up tensions, and promotes other possible imaginaries. And so this would be the second part. Um, I don't know if maybe we can we can kind of open the floor again if you have questions or comments. Mm -hmm. No, then maybe I mean with this one and the, the question before about what is art and what is not. I mean. Um, here, the, the boundaries are definitely gone, right? Because the artist commissions the work to some artisans in China, actually. Um, and then this goes into a museum. Uh, actually, I think this was at the Mali in, in Lima. Um, so here, everything is blurry and, well, art is not only what the artists do, but what they think, what they create, of course. So this adds more difficulty right, to, to having a definition, like a static, fixed definition. But definitely, I mean, it opens up uh, possibilities and, I don't know, meanings, also layers, it adds layers to, to the complexity of this history and, and I think it also adds value, right? Uh, because they actually make us think, right? 
mm. and question and not just go with uh, I don't know what the status quo um, says, right? So, so I think, yeah, this is quite important for uh, Latin America, for the development, or this has been quite important for the de development of Latin American art, um, and kind of, yeah. Yeah. So you were looking more from the perspective of the critic and the art historian mm -hmm. and curator. Um, but kind of in the 90s, late 80s, um, critical theory emerged as a prominent theme in kind of looking at Latin American art as well, mm -hmm. uh, any form of art really. And um, would you say that to give your examples a younger? Uh, would you say that artists in Latin America are also kind of reactive to how Latin American art is perceived from the outside, or is that something that happens more parallel? So, mm. yeah. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I would think that they have reacted, definitely. Um, because also, I mean, my, my own um, theory is that um, artists, especially maybe not so much from the 90s, but more so from the beginning of the 21st century, artists read a lot. And I mean, basically, they are theorists nowadays. So I think all these debates, all this uh, questioning, um, all these theories and texts that have been published, um, they know them, uh, I mean, some of them at least, and um, yeah, and they incorporated um, their own thoughts onto these issues. So yeah, I think they are Part of the of the this ongoing debate nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, quite a quite of course. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a very close connection between the genre of text portray and identity. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about the role of self portray in this kind of activist, uh, activist art or political art? Because I think that there are, uh, that there lies a great chance in, in this kind of, uh, in this kind of art. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, in this very specific case, um, Daniela Ortiz is really talking from experience, right? Um, so I think, uh, yeah, she has worked, um, she's a mother, uh, and she was a migrant uh, in Spain uh, when she, um, got pregnant and then when she had her first son. And so she had to go through all these difficulties of uh, motherhood as a migrant uh, person in the European Union, in Spain uh, in particular. And uh, she also got involved because of her difficulties and her fears. Uh, she uh, started to work with uh, activist groups, um, of other migrant mothers that were um, struggling to get her children back because the state had uh, taken them uh, into, um, how do you call it, into care, uh, you know, like the system, um, yeah, maybe not for adoption, but, you know, into the, the national 
system for uh, for children. Um, and so, and if you listen, Danila has given many interviews um, about this, and she feared all the time that, uh, on the one hand, the father of her son uh, was going to make everything impossible for her to to be with her son in Spain, and that the a social worker would come and take her son away and put it into the system, and that she will not be able to get it back, because this has been the experience of many other mothers in Spain and in Europe. I mean, this is not um, something specific um, of Spain. So here, I mean, she is working with self-portrait, because of course, a big part of her is in this work. Um, she also refers to um, to Frida, and uh, as you know, I mean, she works with herself, right? Um, as the main, uh -huh. yeah. And this is, yeah, and this is very powerful, of course, because you are kind of giving testimony. It's not not only denouncing, but you are giving testimony because you know what happens, right? Um, so, uh, as you said, I think this is very powerful, and 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 also kind of connects in a very special way with the audience, right? A self-portrait is, is powerful and it kind of look, looks at you and, and waiting to be looked back. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would take it in that direction. Um, I don't know if this is a more widespread um, strategy, um, to be honest. But uh, but Daniela, I think she does this quite a lot. Um, yeah. You mentioned earlier the place of enunciation. So mm -hmm. kind of, we have some speaks from mm -hmm. and with that ties into that as well. Um, yeah, having uh, not only like a, well, kind of a generalization of your own experience. Yeah. Like, and linking the personal experience as a person from a Latin American country to other people mm -hmm. from the region or more specific ways. Um, yeah, and and also here, I think this gets more complicated even because I mean neither Sandra Gamarra nor Daniela Ortiz, where Daniela is back in Peru, but they were not speaking from Latin America because they were both in Spain, right? So then they are Latin Americans in Spain, uh, in Europe. Is it, again, um, the place of enunciation? Is it Latin America? Is it not? So this is also uh, kind of another twist to the, just the, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, um, um, yeah, actually, the self-portrait as a place of enunciation, right, would also be um, another strategy, like, yeah, speaking for oneself and putting oneself's body um, into the work, right, uh, quite literally. Or with performance, um, this is also even more literal. I don't know if this answers. So um, for the last 12 years or so of my, um, well, my research has focused on uh, contemporary Latin American art and the artist's approach to violence, mainly political violence, um, but to violence and history. And so I could not leave that outside of this talk tonight. Um, so, I understand that the importance of reflecting on violence has to do not only with becoming aware of the loss of lives, subjectivity, and future, but also with understanding the functioning of the structures in which violence is generated and which we have accepted as given. Along these lines, I would like to insist that uh, violence is not only the product of conditions, pathologies, or specific subjects, uh, but that it is a social construct and it is transmitted collectively both in its exercise and in its reproduction and consumption. I believe that it is essential to approach the phenomenon of violence from the broadest possible perspective 
And that is one that not only um, seeks to identify perpetrators or causes and points and point out the ultimate end of the violent act, but that also takes into account that it is a very complex phenomenon and has multiple dimensions. So from the geopolitical to the anthropological and historical, without forgetting other intrinsic aspects such as pain or potential reparation processes when they exist. So in this sense, art is a particularly suitable field for dealing with investigating and showing the violence that surrounds us and Latin American art, or some of it, is a great example. A significant number of artworks in recent decades address violence in Latin America as a phenomenon linked to the history and politics of the continent. This violence at times is linked to certain genealogies of colonial domination and has to do in any case with the enormous economic and social inequalities that govern the continent since. Now, um, let's think of Harun Faroqi's uh, work titled The Inextinguishable Fire. Um, in this work, Faroqi presents the horrors of uh, Napalm in the Vietnam War. He argues, as you can see um, in the stills, um, he argues that if he shows us, the spectators, the images of that horror, we will not want to see them. So in the video, he finds an alternative way of showing us how Napalm works without the actual images of Vietnam victims. Um, many Latin American artists have seen themselves in the same situation as Faroqui, or may have seen themselves, I think. And so they may have had to ask themselves questions such as, how can we talk um, about the violence that happens in our region? How can we show violence in action? How can we depict injuries, dead bodies, or mutilations on the bodies that suffer this violence? Some artists could possibly answer these questions in the same line as Paroki. Stating, us, uh, stating that if they show us the images of violence, we, the spectators, will close our eyes to them, to their memory, to the specific violent events, and to the general context in which this violence take, takes or took place. Others, on the contrary, would choose to a greater or lesser extent to work with these images of violence and to produce or reproduce them somehow. And my work has focused on the latter. So those artists that chose to work with the images or traces of violence. Um, the question of the representation of violence poses us, first and foremost, the problem of the explicit. On many occasions, the appropriation of explicit images of victims by artists is interpreted as an illegitimate use of the suffering of others and ultimately as a form of uh, so-called porn violence. The controversy around explicit images of violence began during the interwar years. For the first time, um, inaugurating a long tradition of thought, some critics then stated that war photographs, especially those showing corpses, were pornographic because they do not reveal the dignity of those who have died, but reduce their bodies to mere objects of pleasure and excitement. With the Second World War, um, and fundamentally after the revelation of the Holocaust, these considerations were the ones that prevailed. And moreover, Adorno's famous sentence stating that writing poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric, further encouraged the development of this critical stance towards images of violence and suffering. And of course, this sentence was taken too literal. However accurate is the claim that misery and violence are usually high impact and easily sold spectacles, I think that the widespread use of the notion of pornography in relation either to misery or to violence does not explain the uses and functions of the images and artworks that deal with these issues and thus hinders any possibility of discussion. I agree with the late Susan Sontag, who in regarding the pain of others, stated that um, despite the morbidity that horror photographs incite, they have a certain ethical value, because at the very least, they make us aware 
of the fact that everywhere human beings do terrible things um, to each other. She insisted on the need to make public all images of atrocities, questioning the effect of habit and saturation. According to her, images involve us, making us responsible for what we see. And I quote her, let the atrocious images haunt us, even if they are only tokens and cannot possibly encompass most of the reality to which they refer. They still perform a vital function. The images say, this is what human beings are capable of doing. Don't forget. Um, this is the end of the quote. One last aspect that I would like to open for discussion um, today before the last examples um, also connects uh, violence, this issue of violence, with the debate about uh, the identity of Latin American art. And is the following. Is the representation of violence um, a form of exoticism? That is, a way of legitimizing and differentiating these works from art produced in other corners of the world in order to is inscribe them in global circuits and markets? Um, for film critic Ignacio Sánchez Prado, violence is an element that's ha that has been used strategically in Latin American cultural representations of the last three decades. For him, violence is promoted as part of an external agenda linked to a market where that notion is affirmed as a value of use, an ideological, an ideological exchange, and as a brand of a product that is incorporated into globalized cultural cons consumption. Um, this promotion of the representation of violence as a product of globalized cultural consumption implies, for Sanchez Prado, that Latin America is considered then a space of violence, a place where a vertiginous life of misery and otherness takes place that fascinates the pseudo-progressive audiences of international festivals. He's talking more specifically about cinema, but I mean, we can certainly extend this to contemporary visual arts, biennials, um, etc. Of course, not every representation of violence is a political artifact per se, nor does every representation of violence exoticize the place, the place to which it refers. Any analysis of these images or artworks always requires an understanding of the deep economic, social, and political roots of violence, as well as a situated analysis of the artwork itself. I do not consider that putting violence at the center of the production or the cultural analysis implies leaving aside other central issues, since violence actually has deep roots and histories and we must um, study them. Nor I consider that it implies irrevocably naturalizing social conflict and thus depoliticizing it. On the contrary, silencing or not making visible, not making violence visible, or its superficial analysis, are more conducive to depoliticization. Thus, um, to the question of whether we should dismiss all these artistic practices that deal with violence, as opportunistic and exotic or as porno violent, as creating a whole imaginary capable of attracting the attention of the market or the global art world without adding any political value, I would answer that we should not. Um, we need to see these images. We need to know what is happening in the world. And here, um, the title of the 2009 Mexican pavilion at the Venice Biennial comes to mind uh, because the title was What else could we talk about? Um, so here Mexican curator Patemoc Medina and Mexican artist Teresa Margolles worked together um, for this project. The Mexican proposal for the Venice pavilion had an obvious component of political denunciation and it was based on the belief that violence is a subject we need to talk about. Margolles has worked many times, um, as she did in Venice, with fabrics soaked in blood and other fluids of victims of violent events. At some point, she decided to collect the remains from the streets herself, uh, with the help of collaborators, of course, after each murder. So once the police and the forensic work had been carried out, 
And once the authorities had removed the bodies and evidence, the artist cleaned the area um, in which numerous remains, both organic and uh, material, still were in place. With the help of white fabrics, she absorbed the blood, fluids, and mud, uh, and also collected all kinds of waste, such as broken glass. Finally, um, the fabrics were left to dry. When setting up her exhibitions, Malvayas takes these dry fabrics to the place where her work will be exhibited, for example, Venice, and once there, she rehydrates them with local water. In Venice, she did this at the Lido Bridge. Um, yeah. So, and also, as you can see in the left-hand side, uh, she had also collaborators clean the floors of the Venice uh, Palace with water mixed with all these fluids and, and remains. So the visitors would carry in their shoes, in their shoes the traces of violence. So this exhibition, of course, touched some nerves. Since Margoyes puts the, the spotlight on death as the star product of the globalized economy. Although the works do not offer any information on the specific facts beyond the imminent experience of violence, they do have a clear context because she always puts um, exhibit labels with uh, information about the places where the remains come from. So this context leads us to reflect on violence in Mexico and all its political, economic, and historical implications. And um, Margolles has also dealt with uh, femicide, especially in Ciudad Juárez, uh, in the northern border of Mexico. This installation, um, titled Pesquisas, Inquiries, consists of 30 color prints of photographs of the posters of disappeared women covering the streets of Ciudad Juárez. Each of the posters shows only one photograph, enlarged to a size of 100 by 70 centimeters, so they are quite big, taken by the artist from the countless posters of disappeared or kidnapped women that flood the city's streets. The 30 prints take up all the space on the wall, um, and they look at us, and some smile at us. Actually, these pictures come basically from their Facebook profiles. So this, this was the Facebook picture that the relatives of the, of the disappeared women used um, like to, yeah, to put them out on the street. Um, so Teresa Margolles' work is undoubted, undoubtedly a call for attention so that we do not forget femicide, a way of making visible those faces that have been missing for years, some of them even de decades. Faces that have already become part of the urban landscape since the relatives of these women do not stop searching for them and continue to fill the streets of the city with these posters. Faces that, in addition, suffer a second disappearance due to human action. Um, they are painted over, scratched, torn out, and also due to the passage of time. Margolles uses here the artistic strategy of an almost infinite a potential infinite repetition of the same action to visibilize violence. So um, the artists that I have shown you today, I think, resist the normal state of things, the ongoing violence, be it structural or physical, in order to show us and make us aware of the struggles that many undergo in Latin America. They do this through a wide variety of artistic strategies and practices, and some of them even through political activism. These politically engaged artistic practices can be seen as part of an effort of creating awareness, an effort to make the world a bit more just through the means of art. And I will leave it here. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.